I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Have you, Terry? No. Well, they're called flatworms. And there's one sort of crawling along the bottom. You can't even see them, right? Yeah. See how flat it is? Oh, they there are even, there, Those head is just beginning to stick up. Looks like there's little eyes on it or something. Yes, well, those are, those are called eye spots. They don't really, there, there's one turning sideways, see, and now swimming along the bottom of my little tank. Huh. Okay, and there's one, you can see the eye spots on that one. They're not really eyes, they're, but they are light sensitive. They don't, yeah. they don't see images like our eyes do. It also looks they have like little ears. Yeah, yeah. And they look like they have little ears too. They're also sensitive to the light, so usually when I get them in the light, then they all swim out of the way. Oh, that one looks really flat. Yes. I don't know what you can see, but in the middle of that one, you see the one that's swimming up there? That oh, yeah. one has, you can see its uh, mouth. That, there's a tube that comes out from the center of the animal and uh, sucks up stuff from the bottom. It's sort of like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it's nothing yeah. like us, though. <laughs> scientists, have, whoop, excuse me, scientists have studied these uh, quite thoroughly because when uh, they cut parts of a mop, they, each part will grow into a new, one, new uh, flatworm. So they're uh, very interested in studying how that takes place. Anyway, I understand you spend some time going to Fish Creek, right? Yeah, sometimes I try and uh, catch frogs at Fish Creek. Okay, well, have you got the magnifier that I gave you so that you could look at them? Yeah, they're right here. Okay, remember we said that was ten times. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're actually manufacturing, or man actually magnifying these animals about ten times. In fact, uh, the image from the animals is going into this long lens, and then going over here to the television camera, and then down over there to the, uh, to the monitor so that instead of looking through the magnifying glass, we can simply look at the monitor to see uh, what's under the lens. In fact, let's make sure that we're magnifying 10 times by actually measuring it. So there's a ruler down there, see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to bring this, uh, this ruler into position, but there's way too much light because we needed them to look at the flatworm. So I'll pull these lights back so I can get that ruler in position and we can see how much we're magnifying. Okay, now, see it's right at the top, it's right at one on the line. Okay, right here? now count the number of millimeters, that's what those lines are. From so, here? Right from there, okay. So five? It's, no, 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 from that's zero up on top. Okay. Five, five 10, 15, 15 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 24. Okay, so now measure the height of that television screen. Not all the way down, just the picture part. Oh, okay. Higher up. Okay, about there. About 23. 23. So how much are we magnifying? We, that's 230 30 millimeters. millimeters. Okay. 24 millimeters magnified up to 20, 230 is what? Is approximately um, 10? 10 times. Rough, roughly 10 yeah. times, which is about like your magnifier does. Okay, so when you go down to Fish Creek, what do you look for? I look for frogs. Okay. Uh, any of them look like these? Those are tadpoles. Yes, a tadpole. Looks like it has a wing or something yes. on it. And, and I don't know, do you recognize those other little animals swimming around there? Um. Water fleas? Yeah, water fleas. I've got a whole bunch of them. We'll take a close look at them. One of the reasons I wanted you to look at this is even though the tadpole can be injured, it can still live quite well because here's one that's lost part of his tail. See it? Well, it's like I don't know. something just bit it off. Yeah, maybe it? a fish bit it off or something, but it seems to be getting along quite well. So next time when you go down, instead of looking for frogs, if their tadpoles are around, Get a bunch of them with a little net, put them into a glass, take them home and look at them with your magnifying glass. You'll find they're fascinating. I'll do that. Okay, and then here's your, here are the water fleas. Water fleas. Right. And they're a lot of fun to look at because they're transparent, almost. And you can see eggs inside. You can see the heart beating if you magnify them right. And little tiny ones hatching. See the little ones are swimming around in there? Oh yeah, these yeah. tiny little ones right, there. Those. So next time you go to Fish Creek and you see any Daphnia, which is what their scientific name is, or water fleas, get a bunch of them and take them home and look at them too with that magnifying glass because you'll find all kinds of fascinating animals in a pond. <laughs> Did 
Jan, I'd like you to read the ingredients of this uh, cereal, okay. especially the recommended daily allowance of various vitamins. Okay, protein, vitamin A, vitamin C, mm -hmm. thiamine, riboflavin, riboflavin, right, riboflavin, niacin, calcium, iron. Ah, uh -uh, stop right there, iron. Okay. Because I want you to look across and see that this cereal contains 100%. all the percent, you know, the entire amount of iron that you're supposed to have for your daily requirement. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't think that you probably would know what form it was in, so I dumped the entire box of cereal into this mortar and pestle. You know what this is for. Yeah, you chemists use it to Yeah, and they grind it up, up to make it real fine, okay. Right. Well, that's what I did with the cereal, and here it is. Swimming around inside that beaker. That looks pretty gross. I left that for a couple of hours because, as you know, there's a magnet. Have you, have you, I showed you these magnets stirred, didn't I? Here. Yeah, there's a magnet down in there? Yes, there's a magnet down. Okay, now turn it on just a little bit. There it goes. Yeah, and the magnet's yeah. spinning around. Right, there's right. a magnet underneath making this magnet spin, and there's a magnet just like that in the bottom of the cereal. So okay. as it's stirring up, it's collecting all the iron. Okay? Mm -hmm. Here is another magnet at the end of a sort of stick. Would you put okay. it in here until you sort of feel a click, and then you'll pick up the magnet that's collected the iron. There, I think I got it. Think you got it? Yep. Ooh, that's all in the cereal? Yes. And we eat it? Yes, you do. As a matter, as a matter of fact, it's very good for it. It's sort of powdered iron. And that's what it said on there, iron, right? And iron yeah. is, a, is an element. And that's the form it has to be in if it says iron. As a matter of fact, when, it's, when you digest it, it's broken down and absorbed by your body, and it's very important. You, you sure. know, well, it's the important ingredient in the hemoglobin of your blood. It captures the oxygen when you breathe okay. in and sends the, and then supplies the oxygen to all parts of your bodies. So it's very important that you get a good supply of iron, and that's the form that it is in cereal. <laughs> Now, Chris, we both have identical bottles and identical balloons. Okay, I want you to do exactly what I do. Okay. Okay? You're supposed to do what I do. How come yours goes up and mine doesn't? Well, first of all, what has to happen in order for you to blow up the balloon? Um, air must go into the balloon and blow Yeah, if you're up. putting air into the balloon, you got to get it out of the bottle, right? Right. How do you suppose I'm able to do mine? You must have it coming out of the top or somewhere. Someplace, right? Someplace. Watch this. Go! Well, your bottle must be different because... Mine didn't even blow up. In fact, look at this. A hole. A small hole. Now, when you blow it up, what do you do? You take you, your finger off the hole, right? And when, so air can come out. And when you um, blow it up, you put it over so the balloon doesn't blow right. up. Right. So then you put your finger over the hole. Mm. Okay, trade, trade bottles. I'll do what you do now, okay? Kay. What do I have to do? Very good. Okay, now hold it up, and with the other hand, command it to go down. There it goes down. Okay, try it. Take him home and try it. Who are you going to try it on? Great. I'll probably put play it on my brother. He'll okay. probably never get it. Okay, good luck. Jeff, I have an emergency problem for you. Okay. All the lights in the house go out. And you're supposed to go down and check the fuse box or back wherever it is, okay? No flashlight. So you've got to rig up some kind of an emergency light. And all you have available is this. How are you going to make a light with nuts? Yeah, that seems strange, doesn't it? Well, as a matter of fact, what you do is you take a nut and you stick a couple of pins in it like that. Oh, okay. okay? And now all you have to do is light it. You're supposed, you're, of course, you're doing this in the dark, remember? Yeah. So it would be a little more difficult. So you'd have to light maybe a match 
in order to sort of see. But once you get it going, it really burns like that. Well, it's like a candle. Yeah, like a candle. And you could walk down and put out the, or, and go to the fuse box and check it. Now, if you want a really better light, do the same sort of thing, but make it like this. Mm, that's a, a bottle, bottle, right? And this is a. I have a thumbtack pasted to the top of the bottle, and then this uh, cupcake liner, which works as a reflector, and there's the light source. You see it right there? Yep. Okay. The Let's, nut. The nut. Let me get that one started, and then I'm going to turn out the lights, and I think you'll be surprised at how bright the light from a burning nut really can be. Because right now it doesn't look very impressive because the lights in the room are on, right? Yeah. Okay, well, you'll see. Okay, there's that one started. And I'll turn this around like this so we can... Okay, now let me turn out the lights. Watch. See? Yeah, it's pretty bright. Yeah, it's fairly bright. Okay. And I could use that to... Yeah, you could work your way downstairs or wherever you have to go. Right, I'll turn it back on again. Okay. So, there you are. Now, after you've uh, fixed the fuse, you can blow this out and come back upstairs and have a reward. Have a nut. Have a nut. Thanks. In fact, you may not realize it, but may, you made a light that's good enough to eat. Right there is a man. See him, Vanessa? Yes. Okay. That gives you some idea of the size of this large cave and the size of these stalagmites and stalactites that are over here. Oh, that's what they're called. Yes. Yeah. Right. And here there are some really great ones hanging from the ceiling. Yeah. Now, they are called stalactites. And you can sort of remember that because they stick tightly to the ceiling. So oh. that's the stalactite. Those that are down here on the floor are called stalagmites. Okay. okay. Have you ever seen them in real life? Yes, I have. Yeah, where? I saw, well, I saw some in a cave in the mountains. Yeah. What they look like? Well, they were in mostly in a cone shape, mm -hmm. but some were in the pencil shape. Okay. Yeah. How big? Well, some were about the size of my arm mm -hmm. and the size of my pinky. Oh, I see. Now, the reason why they formed is that the water above the cave in the ground above the cave dissolve various minerals and when it got to the cave it, it some of the water evaporated and left the mineral behind oh. okay and that's what you are going to do when you make your own stalagmites and stalactites oh. right there is one of them what you do is you get epsom salts which you can buy in a drugstore okay. and you put a lot of it in the water in two glasses and then you put string between them like that so what's going to happen to the water that goes up the string well, I guess the string is used as a wick. As a wick, right. Okay. And the water goes through the string down mm -hmm. to the and bottom. Then, and then it'll form a drop right here and finally drop and go, drop down to the piece of wood, which you put on the bottom to so it'll absorb the moisture. Okay. Now, as it begins to drop here, though, some of it evaporates and leaves behind some of the Epsom salts, just like in a real cave. So you're now forming what up here? A stalag. A stalag tight. tight. Right. And a stalag mite down below. Now, this one has been going for about a day, and I timed it. There's a drop maybe every 15 minutes or so. In a real cave, the drops may be once every two days or once every five minutes, depending entirely upon what kind of water. But usually it takes several thousand years at least. Whoa. To, to form a good stalagmite and stalactite. Here's one that's been going for about two days. Oh, well, that's. Yeah. So really you can see damage. it's a lot better. In fact, what, look, there's a drop about to start. Let's watch oh, yeah. it now. See if we can see it drop. Oh, it just dropped. There it goes, yes. So that's two days, and over here is about four days. Well, that one's really building yeah. up. Yeah. And eventually, I hope I'm going to let them go and see if maybe they'll join together like they do in a real cave. So if you want to make your own stalagmites and stalactites at home, what do you do? You use Epsom, Epsom salt, salt right. and you p mix it with water, mm -hmm. and you put it in two, glass, mm -hmm. two glasses, and join a string to each glass. Okay, and be sure and put it on a piece of wood or absorbent, maybe a blotter or something like that. And they'll gradually drip down here and form your own homemade stalagmites and stalactites. This is a circular fluorescent bulb, Eliana. Have you ever seen one like that? 
Nope. Well, they go in fixtures like this. And notice, there's nothing here in the middle. Nope. No wires, any place. Okay. Nothing. Okay. Now, would you please take the fluorescent and put it in the microwave? In the microwave? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Put it right on top of that water there, like that. Okay. Now, you know how to work a microwave? Yeah. Turn it on for 15 seconds. It's on high already, okay? Punch the button. Oops. Whip, not quite enough. It glows. Yes. Why does it do that? Like a magic trick. No <laughs> wires. Mm. Well, there are two possible explanations for why it does that. First of all, a fluorescent tube works because inside there's mercury vapor, and when you wear an electric electricity through it, you agitate the mercury vapor, then it bangs against the inside of the tube that's coated with a special coating, and that makes the coating glow. Okay. So the microwaves either vibrate the coating or they okay. agitate the mercury vapor, which makes the coating glow. So we can figure out which is which by taking this, a broken fluorescent bulb. Yeah. There you see the coating on the inside, uh -huh. okay? If we put that in the microwave and it glows, then we'll know it's the coating, right? Okay, yes. so go ahead and put it in the microwave. And then put in this water. Why should I do that? Well, the instructions on the microwave say you shouldn't cook anything in a microwave without having at least 50 cc's of water because that will prevent it from burning out, okay? Close the door. 15, 20 seconds on the timer, and away we go. Doesn't glow. Nope. nope. So that so indicates. Must be the mercury. Must be the mercury vapor. vapor. Okay. Now you try it. Okay. Take out the broken one. Let us assume that you are in the kitchen doing your homework, and the kitchen lights burn out. You know what to reach for? The fluorescent lamp. lamp. Put it in the microwave. With the water in it. Okay. And then set it and... And now you have no excuse for not doing your homework. You have plenty of light from the microwave. Now, with these simple pieces of equipment, you can make a musical instrument on which you can play an unlimited number of tunes. You recognize what that is? Yes, it's uh, inside of a paper towel. And this? A pencil. That? Some wax paper. All right, and that? Elastic. Okay. First thing you have to do is, with the pencil, make a hole in the paper tube. Okay. There, there you go. Wait a minute. Let me make it a little, put it through so it's a little bigger. Okay. 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 Next, I'll stand it up like this. Yeah. You take the rubber band. Okay. And put it around the end of the tube to hold the wax paper in place. Okay. Should I do it twice? Twice. Do it twice so it's okay. nice and tight. Okay. Now all you need to do is hum into the end and you will have your musical instrument. No, 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 no. Hum. Oh, okay. Hum. Let us try that again. After all, you're not making a bugle <laughs> or a trombone. You are making, what do you suspect it's going to sound like? Um, a, maybe a kazoo? Yes, a kazoo which is one of those sort of instruments that have a little tissue paper in it. Okay, okay this time, hum, please. <laughs> I told you, you see, you could play an unlimited number of selections. Yeah. You, it depends entirely upon how much musical talent you have, and you seem to have considerable, so here you are. Try again. But how do you... How does that do it? Well, when you hum into this, you're actually vibrating the air inside here. Some of it can come out over here so you don't blow the end off. But <laughs> your, the, the sound waves that you're making vibrate the, the paper at the end, and that's what gives it that sort of fuzzy sound. Yeah. Try it again. Oh, don't blow. <laughs> don't blow. Hum, hum, please. There. Hum. Right. I don't know what that selection is that you're playing, but you seem to have enough musical talent to be able to play anything you want, so good luck. Thank you. You know what that stuff is out there? It's water vapor. Yes. And can you see any steam? Yeah, right there.
right? We, I can't beginning. see any. Well, you can't see it, but you know it's there. You know it's there from the distance from there over. And of course, it's coming down this tube through these coils like this and coming yes. all the way back over here. From the kettle. From the tea kettle, right. So what is the temperature of the steam? 100 degrees. Cause 100 degrees Celsius, right? Right. Okay. Because the scientists have defined the term Celsius, Celsius uh, and 100 as the temperature of boiling water or steam. Okay, now uh, see those gloves over there? Yes. Put on those gloves and take that piece of paper and hold it here in the steam. Okay. And you know the reason for the gloves is that's hot. Very mighty hot. Mighty hot. Okay, hold it up there. Nice and good. Right, at, right up next to where the steam is. Nothing, right? Okay, you feel <laughs> warm? Okay, put it down, and I want you to try something else. Now you can take the gloves off, because I'd like you to try this match. And just bring oh, the, it's not gonna lay the match. Bring the match right up underneath where the steam is. It's just getting wet. Not hot enough to light a match. Okay. No. Nope. Now, Aaron, what we're going to do is put a blowtorch right here at this coil. So the steam that's coming out of here is 100 degrees, and now we're going to get it hotter than 100 degrees to superheat it so that by the time it comes out here, it's much hotter than 100 degrees. Why, why at the coils? Why are you going to... Well, the coil's there so that you can make sure that you get a good supply of heat to heat the steam. Okay? So there's more. So there's more. So you get set with the gloves and get ready to bring the paper over as soon as you see that we have a good supply of steam. In other words, this is going to be an invisible section out here, right? Right, it's going to okay, be more watch. steam. Nothing's happening yet. Well, you have the torch to change. Oh, it's getting a little bit more. Right. Now there's way more. Whole. Lots and lots of steam. Yeah, the water vapor is way out here, so all this section is yes. superheated steam. Okay, now hold the paper up there. Hold it nice and tight. Bring it in a little closer. A little closer. Keep going in. Keep going in. Now it's burning. Yeah, there. Okay, now you can take the... You burn a hole in the paper with steam. Steam? Okay, I thought now it wasn't take, hot enough. Yeah, t t I'll take the gloves off and uh, get ready with the match. Lighted. Yeah, obviously a lot hotter than just ordinary steam, right? Almost as hot as fire. Right. Well, as a matter of fact, it's hot enough to ignite the match and to burn the paper. And engineers want superheated steam so that they can get it to do much more work. It's under much greater pressure. And notice, by the way, that we're cooling off the coil with steam. Because, see, it's back to where it was. What would happen if... You only torch the kettle and didn't have this big tube well, here. Well, you, you could do it with the kettle, but it would be a lot harder to do it because the kettle is so big so that you can do it much more easily with the, with the coil. Anyway, you now have had a chance to experiment with superheated steam, hot enough to light a match. Superheated. Right.